Howdy folks, welcome back to Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the time of year when I like to take a break from my usual reviews of science fiction and fantasy and steampunk to talk about Christmas. Last year I did a show about the origin of our Christmas traditions in England and how these influenced America. In particular, Queen Victoria brought back many of these from her native Germany because the English at the time didn't see Christmas as that much of a big deal. Now, since I'd already talked about that, I thought, what should I talk about this year? I mean, there's not a lot of Christmas-themed science fiction. But Mrs. Desperado came to the rescue, and she said, why not talk about ghost stories? And I said, ghost stories? She said, yes, my family used to tell ghost stories at Christmas. Mine didn't, so I had to look it up. And I found that, indeed, that there were many traditions, particularly in England, of telling ghost stories around Christmas. As I said, my family did not tell ghost stories at Christmas. And I asked my sisters about this to see if they remembered anything like that, and they said, no, they didn't. I mean, we kids told each other ghost stories and, you know, something that they would especially do at sleepovers and so on, maybe at Halloween. But our ghost stories were often jokes disguised as ghost stories. <laughs> In particular, there was one about a little girl who wore a yellow ribbon around her neck and would not tell anybody why. And, of course, it, it goes on and on and on. <laughs> and in the end, it's really dumb. The thing is that the adults really never told us ghost stories that I can remember. And sometimes jokes, in particular my Swedish grandmother, loved the Scandinavian jokes of the sort that I have done on this channel in early September, two years running now. So you can always look back at those and get the idea of some of these good old Ole Olsen jokes that she loved so much. Um, but ghost stories? Not really. It was just as kids. And as I said, a lot of them were pretty stupid. Mrs. Desperado's family, however, they did have that tradition, and they were not German or Scandinavian. They were English and Scotch-Irish. And uh, the adults would actually tell some of these spooky stories, and around Christmas time. Now, now in particular, the Holloways, the, the Irish ones. These were not like our published stories, but they were more like the urban legends that we'll hear. You know, like, oh, there was a scape murderer, and he had a hook, and there was a couple out necking by the lake, and the girl heard something, <laughs> and you know the story. Uh, but these were a lot less dumb and trite. There was one particular that Grandmother Holloway would tell about these little twin girls. Now, she lived in Oklahoma in the 1930s, and this was a, she had a house near the railroad tracks. And these little girls were coming, presumably to see her, and so she came out of her house to greet them, but in between was the railroad. And a train came along, and so the girls had to wait. And so she waited while the train passed, and when the train was gone, the girls were gone too. And so she was very alarmed. She, you know, looked around, made sure that they hadn't been hit by the train. She asked around, and she found to her dismay that the little girls had died that very day. And yet, it had not been an accident. It had been some kind of a sickness. So they were not well enough to be out and walking around uh, and coming to see her. And so, you know, it's the kind of story that you think, huh, that's kind of creepy. And that was the sort of thing they would talk about around Christmas. There's another thing that her grandfather said. He'd been a GI in World War II, and he said that at an exact time when the peace was declared, that he and many other soldiers saw a giant cross in the sky. You know, maybe it was, I don't know, maybe it was a glare off the sun or something like that, but they observed this cross. And we couldn't find any record of this online. But there are legends of much longer ago, like the Emperor Constantine of Rome, who saw a cross, had a victory, and then became a Christian. A similar one about a Danish king and also saw a cross in the sky, and that's why the Danish flag has a cross on it, supposedly. So, interesting. If any of you have heard of this and might know uh, of any sources, I'd very much appreciate it. Now, 
I was ignorant of ghost stories of Christmas, so I resolved to undertake a crash course. And a quick web search that I said before, they, there were a lot of articles about it, so I read these. And I also uh, found a list of stories to read. And so since I only had a week to do it, I mostly had to listen to them. Some of them were on YouTube channels that are devoted to this, which is kind of interesting. I really hadn't, you know, listened to these before. Also, there were several uh, of these old stories that I could download from Project Gutenberg for free, of course. And these were story collections. So before I get to the stories, though, I need to talk about the tradition a little bit more. I'll begin with a quote of a quote from an article in BookRiot.com. In 1891, a British humorist named Jerome K. Jerome observed that whenever five or six English-speaking people meet round a fire on Christmas Eve, they start telling each other ghost stories. It is a genial festive season, and we love to muse upon graves and dead bodies and murders and blood. <laughs> now, this association may seem strange to us Americans, and I remember how many devout Christians, many of whom I knew, were outraged by the 1993 Tim Burton movie, Nightmare Before Christmas, which happens to be my favorite movie ever. I think it's a charming and wonderful story about you know, Jack Skellington being jealous of Christmas and learning to appreciate what he has in his own talents. But, you know, to them, it was like they've taken this satanic holiday and have imposed it on our sacred Christmas. <laughs> uh, and I wonder if Tim Burton had some tradition in his family of ghost stories at Christmas, because that sounds like a very English or perhaps Irish name. It's my understanding that this ghost story tradition goes way back to the pagan times. And it may have been part of the reason why Oliver Cromwell, the Puritan dictator who overthrew King Charles I, he banned Christmas. He was the original Grinch, and he did never, never did mend his ways. <laughs> and uh, he made it illegal to celebrate Christmas. You had to go to work on Christmas Day, unless, of course, it was Sunday. And you were not allowed to sing at all on Christmas. Now, he had some legitimate gripes about corruption in the church and uh, the country, but didn't he go a little bit too far there? I mean, he ruffled so many feathers that when they restored the monarchy in 1660, he had already died, but they dug up his body from his grave and hung it in chains like a, you know, a, like a condemned traitor on the intersection at Tyburn. <laughs> so, you know, maybe banning Christmas had a, a little bit to do with this. There's another article that I found on history.com that said that after the publication of Charles Dickens's uh, Christmas Carol, that it became a big fad and then a lot of writers rushed to capitalize on this tradition plus the popularity of Dickens's work. And these included, besides Dickens himself, Elizabeth Gaskell, Mar Margaret Oliphant, and Arthur Conan Doyle of Sherlock Holmes fame. Now, there were a lot of notable female authors at this time. Uh, contrary to public, popular belief that women couldn't get published <laughs> in the Victorian era. And some of these were big, and you can find a lot of works for them by them, you know, on online sites like Gutenberg. There were a number of American writers who also tried to bring this to America, including Henry James and Nathaniel Hawthorne. Washington Irving, who wrote Sleepy Hollow, started even earlier, back in the 1820s, and he had several Christmas-themed ghost stories uh, published around them. Why ghost stories at Christmas, though? We must ask ourselves. Now, some writers speculate that this kind of story is perfect for telling on the long, cold nights when uh, Christmas occurs, and you're all sitting around the fire, and the wind is howling around outside, and just makes it that much more spooky. Not so much here in Arizona, <laughs> where it's it's perfect outside, and the nights aren't that long because we're a little further south. England, however, is at the same latitude as Canada, and so yeah, the nights do get very long indeed. And at the time, they had just gotten out of the little ice age, in which the winters were much colder for a time. And so Christmas was a pretty brutal season for a while. And regarding the pagan holidays, we Germans had a thing called Yule, which is now associated with Christmas, but it was a totally pagan holiday. 
and it was an ancient Germanic holiday in honor of the pagan gods, including Woden. In fact, he was called Yolnir because Yule, Yol, was his holiday. It was a time to honor the dead ancestors and possibly associated with pagan death cults. And the time is also associated with the wild hunt of the Norse gods, in which they would like chase these fallen souls across the sky with, you know, these spectral horses and so on. If you saw it, it was considered very unlucky, a portent of bad things to come. It was also a time when the undead Draugr, which is a revenant, that is an undead corpse, might rise and walk the earth to menace the living. And so it was kind of an early form of zombies. <laughs> So we have a clear association with uh, ghosts and the supernatural. Well, as far as those revenants, uh, there are old Scandinavian tales about that. And even though we're part Scandinavian, my family did not remember any of these. But there's one particular where this man's wife and many of his neighbors go mad and they die. And then after they're buried, they rise again <laughs> to come after him. And he has to play the zombie movie hero, hero and like strike down their bodies and burn them to keep them from coming back. So you think maybe that's a little bit more like the zombie movies that we have rather than the Caribbean tradition in which a zombie is usually like a corpse animated by a sorcerer in order to do his bidding. These are more like something that's, you know, supernatural and evil by its nature. But without further ado, I better get to the stories <laughs> before I take up too much time. Now, let's look at some of these more significant stories, uh, examples of some of these. I didn't get through all of them that I found, didn't have enough time, but I did very much enjoy it. And I happened to read some stuff about Christmas traditions as well while I was at it. And maybe that'll be fodder for another video at some time. Some of these stories aren't strictly Christmas stories. Some are just winter stories, that, but in some way they fit the season. First of all, of course, there's Dickens with his famous Christmas Carol in which the miser, Ebenezer Scrooge, is visited by four ghosts. Remember, there's Jacob Marley. This catches a lot of people. They only think of the three Christmas ghosts. Now, everybody's familiar with that story, but on the heels of the success, he wrote some more, including one that I read called The Chimes. And this is a little bit of a redo of Christmas Carol. This one stars a poor man named Toby Veck, and he loves the chimes from the local church, and they seem to speak to him. Nobody else can hear what they say. Now, one time at, at Christmas, he's very despondent. He goes up to the top of this tower uh, to look at, to see the bells, and they are like goblins. I mean, they have these goblin spirits, and they speak to him very explicitly, telling him to mend his ways and showing him a possible future without him, where he dies, uh, where he, I guess, out of despair, throws himself from the tower, something like that, and what horrible things befall his daughter and other people that he loves. So it's a little bit like Capra's Wonderful Life. And basically, they tell him that he is worthwhile and that he should not listen to those aristocrats who say that the poor are all worthless and criminals and bums. No, he should stick up for himself and his family. Now, I mentioned America's own Washington Irving, one of my favorite authors. Now, he liked to put a twist on his ghost stories. Uh, there was one called The Spectre Bridegroom, in which this man is traveling with his friend who's betrothed. It's like an arranged marriage. And they're going to travel to present him to his bride. But the man dies. And he has to go to tell the girl and her family that the guy has died. But... He is so taken by the bride that he pretends to be that guy. So it's not really a ghost story, even though everybody thinks he's a ghost after they find out that the guy is dead. <laughs> and there's another great, great twist on this in, in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which is not specifically a Christmas story, but it has to do with this part of the year. And it's a classic. And so I had to reread it and you know reacquaint myself with how great it is. Now, some more lesser-known stories. Now, a lot of them are morality tales in the vein of Dickens. One of these is called The Ghost by William D. O'Connor. In this one, there's a rich man, a doctor, 
who is supposed to be helpful to humanity, right? Hippocratic oath, but he's kind of tough towards the poor. And he has, he owns these um, tenements, but she's going to kick this poor woman out of her apartment on Christmas Day because she hasn't been able to pay her rent. And a ghost of a friend, an idealistic friend who died in his youth, visits him to say, don't do it. Be a good Christian. You know, give her a break. <laughs> and so it's it's kind of similar. It's a heartwarming story, though. In a little bit creepier tone, we have the 415 Express by Amelia B. Edwards. And this is a story of justice from beyond the grave, where this guy is on a train and he meets this stranger who is talking about all his plans and and what he's going to do for the area. And when he gets to his destination, he says, yeah, I met a, a relative of yours. And they said, but he's disappeared. He's presumed dead. And it turns out that there's been foul play. When you talk about death and the transition between death and life, there's a very good story called The Transition by Algernon Blackwood. And this is one of Mrs. Desperado's favorite writers. He writes a lot of uh, supernatural stories. It's a very uh, tri Twilight Zone-ish piece about a man who meets with disaster on the way home from Christmas shopping, and he doesn't realize it. <laughs> and not at first, anyway. Now, here's one with a great title, Christmas Eve on Haunted Hulk by Frank Cowper. And this is like a tale of survival. This guy's out hunting because uh, he's visiting a friend in this remote area. So he doesn't really know anybody else. The friend's busy. So he's out hunting on the um, desolate countryside when a storm comes up and he is forced to take shelter on this wrecked ship that's like on this river near the mouth of the river near the sea. And it's very harrowing and there's all these creepy noises, uh, you know, scraping and footsteps and all this intimation that sometime there was this very evil deed done in the ship. One of the ones that Mrs. Desperado hardly recommended to me was called Smee by Ian Burridge. And this has nothing to do with Peter Pan. This is a kind of a ghostly variation on hide and seek and well worth, well worth reading. There's also a Christmas meeting by Rosemary Temperley. Another of these ones where life and death, uh, time kind of becomes imma immaterial. Uh, a very short, but well done story. One that I liked in particular was called Savior Gate by Russell Kirk. And this is also very Twilight Zone-ish. And a man, you know, goes to this inn. He's he's traveling. He's very troubled. And uh, these people keep telling him, no, don't worry. There's nothing to worry about. And you begin to wonder, is he dead? Or is he imagining things? Or is this going to be a second chance? So they actually keep you in suspense. Here's one that involves paganism, and particularly the Druids and so on. It's called... Lucky's Grove by H.R. Wakefield, in which a family cuts down a tree from a sacred grove, unwittingly bringing on the wrath of the gods. And you think that maybe Lucky means Loki. <laughs> now, some of these stories are still amazingly fresh after all these years. I mean, for example, um, Sleepy Hollow is 200 years old. And some of, and I, and I like Irving because some of his stuff is actually funny, <laughs> even even now, 200 years later. Now, some of these stories, though, seem tropish. And though, to be fair, a lot of these cases, these authors may have invented the idea and others used them over and over, and now they seem like a trope. Nonetheless, they are still fun. Sometimes we don't want to be surprised. We want to have what we kind of expect. In other cases, they start out like a trope, but they may surprise you, which is also fun. Many of these stories can be downloaded for free in ebook form on Gutenberg.org, my favorite resource. Although you typically have to do a little bit of searching to find a particular story, because they're usually in collections, uh, often of many authors, although Algernon Blackwood has several good ones of just his stories, and of course Dickens and Irving as well. Others, you may have to do a little bit of diligence to find them. You can also listen to several of these for free on YouTube on certain channels, the two of which I encountered were uh, 
classic ghost stories podcast by Tony Walker, one of Mrs. Desperado's favorites because she loves his British voice. And there's one with a woman narrator called uh, Morgan Scorpion, and she is also British. Now, the BBC did a series on ghost stories uh, from 1971 to 1978, specifically ghost stories of Christmas. And these were revived sporadically, I guess, after 2005 on the BBC. But I haven't figured out how to watch them. I've seen some of the trailers and they look good. So I'm hoping that I can uh, watch them at some point. Now, from this project, I learned several things. First of all, that I need to broaden my understanding of Christmas and Christmas traditions. It's a lot broader than I thought. Second, that some of these folk tales and ghost stories are wonderful, and the more I read, the better writer I'll become, because the more I can incorporate some of these notions and uh, techniques into my own writing. Thirdly, that maybe we Americans ought to kind of tone down the materialism a little bit, and uh, the excessive consumption, and get back to more of the family and uh, fellowship type of things, in which telling stories can be an important part. Now, in the description of this video, I'm going to include links to some of these articles that I drew upon uh, for this, and also to the two channels I mentioned. Of course, I always include my own work in the links. In this case, I think I'm going to go for some of the short stories. In particular, there were three books, uh, collections by George Donnelly, a guy I encountered online. Now, he likes to do flash fiction and he's made numerous collections and not just the three that I was involved in that you can buy on Amazon and uh, one, of these th one of these collections that I'm in however involves Christmas so it's perfect right so please like and subscribe and help us spread the good steampunk word also I'd like to hear from you would, have you had ghost stories in your tr Christmas traditions, for example? And if so, I'd like to I'd like to hear about them. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos and Merry Christmas from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary and very jolly. <laughs>